Welcome tonight to Houston Baptist University. We're glad you have uh, braved the prospect of uh, precipitation and, and other possibilities out there. The wind is starting to kick up, but my hair always looks like this, so there's no, really nothing, uh, nothing wrong from that point of view. We're really glad you're here. I think all of us are in for a very stimulating evening. It should be a lot of fun. Uh, our speaker is, is an enormously engaging person, of course, uh, uh, deeply thoughtful, and uh, I think we'll, we'll say some things that will encourage all of us from various points of view and from, from various uh, 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 perspectives in life. It, it's wonderful to have you on the campus. We have numerous uh, visitors to the university here this evening, and we are glad that you are here. We think you're in one of the most uh, beautiful buildings on this campus. You're in the Morris Cultural Arts Center, and you're in uh, the Belen Chapel. And uh, as you look around you, you'll see some gorgeous stained glass window, you'll, windows, you'll, uh, window. Uh, you'll have others uh, uh, one day off to the sides. You'll see uh, this uh, magnificent uh, pipe organ, a uh, million dollar plus pipe organ uh, uh, behind me. And then as you leave, if you haven't had the chance even to turn around already and see it, uh, you have a beautiful 17th century Van Dyke uh, painting that was recently uh, installed and that uh, 17th century painting is uh, is uh, entitled John the Baptist in the Wilderness and uh, so we, we are excited to have that here. You're in a very beautiful place and in an inspiring place. This is a place where there are uh, recitals and lectures, uh, worship experiences uh, and uh, academic experiences uh, uh, for our, for our uh, students as well. Welcome to Houston Baptist University. We hope if you haven't uh, had the opportunity yet that you'll be able to, uh, to look around uh, and, and see the campus. I'm really looking forward to uh, the evening's lecture. I know that we're going to have a very uh, encouraging, enlightening, uh, stimulating, well, stimulus, that's not exactly the right word uh, anymore, is it? But uh, it, it'll, it'll be um, in, inspiring uh, at the very least. My privilege to bring, to bring Charles Bacarist uh, to the podium. Charles is the vice president for uh, advancement here at the university and he'll continue our introductions. Charles. Thank you Dr. Sloan and, and welcome to Houston Baptist University where tonight we are very pleased to welcome the American Enterprise Institute and its president Arthur C. Brooks to campus. The tonight's uh, discussion is is capitalism worth saving? The battle over free enterprise. And uh, it is my distinct pleasure to introduce one of the great heroes of American nonpartisan public policy. He is committed to expanding liberty, increasing individual opportunity, and strengthening free enterprise. Arthur C. Brooks is the president of the American Enterprise Institute, AEI, as we know them by their initials. He is a former Louis A. Bantle Professor of Business and Government Policy at Syracuse University and the author of eight books and many articles on topics ranging from the economics of the arts to applied mathematics. His most recent publication, which we do have available outside in McNair Hall, is The Battle, How the Fight Between Free Enterprise and Big Government Will Shape America's Future. Before pursuing his work in public policy, Dr. Brooks spent 12 years as a professional musician with the City Orchestra of Barcelona and other ensembles. French horn is his instrument. Joining Dr. Brooks, we are very pleased to also welcome from AEI, uh, Toby Stock, Ellet George, and Eric Tietzel. We are pleased that they have come down from Washington as well. We also know that this is the first opportunity for many of you to be on our campus, and we also see numerous friends of the university in the audience tonight. We're honored to host you and we value the opportunity to share our campus for this important event. Tonight we'll hear Dr. Brooks offer keynote remarks that others have described as a demonstration of his greatest skill, which is the articulation for the moral case of the free market and the principles that we hold dear, and the struggle between the competing visions of America's future, European-style statism versus our long-standing culture of free enterprise. Following his keynote, HBU Provost Dr. Paul J. Bonicelli will represent the university in a discussion with Dr. Brooks where they will explore Christianity, morality, and market capitalism. Dr. Bonicelli comes to our HBU family from the world of public policy and service at the highest levels of our government. He was confirmed by the United States Senate 
in the George W. Bush administration as assistant administrator for the Agency for International Development. In that post, Dr. Bonicelli oversaw Latin America and the Caribbean and the United States' efforts to export freedom and free market capitalism to that region of the world. Prior to his governmental service, Dr. Bonicelli also was involved in higher education before he came to HBU. He was one of the top academic administrators at Patrick Henry College and assisted in the founding of that university. And he also taught at Grove City University. Dr. Bonicelli has his PhD from the University of Tennessee and his master's from Regent University. So we are very pleased that he joined the faculty here at HBU uh, just two years ago, almost three now. So uh, Dr. Bonicelli will, will lead from there. The battle is on, and the soul of America is at stake. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome Dr. Arthur C. Brooks. Thank you. Thank you so much for that generous introduction. It's a delight to be here. It's an honor for us uh, from AEI to be here at HBU. Um, this is uh, an, an event that I've been looking forward to. It's uh, not often that an author at a, a Washington think tank has an opportunity to, to talk about both free enterprise in the context of Christian values and to do so openly. Um, it's, it's something that I, I relish, uh, and it's something that I wish more leaders of secular institutions could find, uh, could find opportunities to do. So thank you very much for having me tonight, and thank you for coming out despite the weather. I know it's pretty threatening. Um, and uh, I should note that I'm on a book tour right now, and last week I was in Chicago, and there was absolutely spectacular thunderstorms going on. And I was, I was giving a speech on the, uh, a high floor of a downtown uh, office building, and behind me there was a, a two-story spectacular window out onto Lake Michigan, and there was this thunderstorm going on, you know, rays of lightning. And at the, at the beginning, uh, I said, I made a remark, and I, I said the words, big government, and a clap of thunder, <laughs> right? And, and I said, you know, this is a sign. This really is a sign. And w th this would be particularly appropriate here, although I'm not sure that it would be quite, quite, ha quite have the effect, but, but you get the idea. Um, if you could just imagine a clap of thunder every time I say big government, that'll be really helpful to me. Um, I'm going to talk to you about the book that I've written called The Battle. And this book has a, a central claim that might sound controversial to you. That claim is that America is in a culture war. Now, I'm not talking about the culture war of the 1990s that some of you are really familiar with about religion and gay rights and guns and abortions. Those are incredibly important issues to many of you and certainly to me. But I'm talking about a war over a different cultural schism. And that's the culture of free enterprise versus the culture of European-style social democracy. I assert in this book that we have to choose, and that America is choosing right now, and that's why we see all of the fighting that we see going on in our country. It's not about economics, it's about the kind of culture that we want to be. Do we want to continue to be a free enterprise nation based on limited government, on rewards and consequences that are passed out according to markets, and a celebration of entrepreneurship, or, or are we moving more to a culture like our European friends, which has a large and expanding government, which has a managed economy, and which tries to get rid of income inequality at all costs. Which culture do we want? We have to choose. And I'm going to talk about the stakes in this choice here tonight. Why does it matter? Well, I'm going to argue that we need to choose free enterprise. And I'm going to tell you why I think that's so. And I'm, and I'm going to give you a hint. I'm not going to tell you that it's because we need to make more money. Even though when we're in a recession, and a lot of people are hurting, I'm not going to make the argument that free enterprise is about us getting richer. I'm going to make the argument that free enterprise is about making us happier and giving more opportunity to future generations. I'm going to, I'm going to tonight make three arguments that I hope you'll remember, if you remember nothing else from, from my comments tonight. The first argument I'm going to make is that free enterprise is truly mainstream that the people who stand against free enterprise in our country today are in a statistical fringe. That if you agree with me about the free enterprise system, you are in a 70% majority. The second point I'm going to make is that the system that brings the most flourishing to the most people, and consequently, which is the greatest moral imperative, is the free enterprise system. And I'm going to give you statistical reality that shows why I believe that's the case. I'm going to give you evidence that makes that argument. 
And the third argument I'm going to make is that the free enterprise system, notwithstanding what the current president and our leaders say today, is the fairest system. It is the fairest system according to fairness as defined by most Americans. So those are the three arguments I'm going to make, and, it, and if you leave understanding those three arguments, I'll, I'll have been successful tonight. Now, when I say we're in a culture war, that's actually not my idea. That comes from the President of the United States, the current President of the United States. In uh, May, of May, May of 2009, May 13th to be exact, he was giving the commencement address at Arizona State University. Some of you may have seen this. It was really well publicized because presidents, when they give their first commencement address on a college campus, people pay attention. They want to know how a new president is going to advise young people, people who are just starting out on their careers. So what did he tell the graduates in May of 2009? This is, I mean, what would you tell the graduates of a major university in May of 2009? This is the, one of the darkest moments in the current recession. You and I were afraid. We didn't know what the future of the free enterprise system was or what the future of our economy was. We didn't know if the American Republic was in danger in the spring of 2009. So if you got up in front of a few thousand graduating seniors at a great university like Arizona State University, what would you tell them? Maybe you'd tell them, go out, save our country. Go out and create the jobs the way your fathers and grandfathers did. Go be entrepreneurs, which is your patrimony, which is the culture of our country. Make, make growth, make opportunity, create the, the economy that you see in your mind. Be creative, be good stewards. Go be ambitious for all the right reasons. Maybe that's what you'd say. That's not what President Obama said. Here's what he told the young people on May 13th, 2009, quote, you're taught to chase after all the usual brass rings. You try to be on this who's who list and that top 100 list. That has been in our culture for far too long. Let me suggest that such an approach won't get you where you want to go. It displays a poverty of ambition, unquote. In other words, the system of free enterprise, of ambition, of entrepreneurship, that took generations behind us to the level where we are today isn't good enough anymore. It's culturally wrong. It's time to change our culture. That is a declaration of a culture war. We can pretend in the United States that the current debates in Washington, D.C. are over four or five percentage points on the marginal tax rate, a couple of regulations here or there, a little bailout, a little takeover. It's all about the money. We can pretend that all we want, but the president is not pretending that. The current Congress is not pretending that. They're fighting to change our culture. And if we don't act, if we like the culture of free enterprise and we don't act, we're going to lose. Is that what we want? Well, let's see. As a matter of fact, let's start by asking, what do Americans want? And that's a big question for me. I'm somebody who is a number cruncher. I work a lot in public opinion polling. And when I see a cultural change like this, the first thing I ask is, well, does this reflect the views and the wishes and the desires of most Americans? Maybe it doesn't. You know, I know what I want Americans to want. I know it's complicated. I know what I, I want for this country, and I want Americans to agree with me. I want free enterprise. My whole career is based on the concept that free enterprise gives people the liberty to execute the plan of their own Imagine success, that when people are successful, it lifts me up. And I'm an economist. I look at the data, and I, I think that's true. As a matter of fact, later in my remarks, I'm going to show you why I think that's true. But I don't necessarily think that all Americans agree with me. I've met lots of people who don't. So the first thing I did when I was starting to write this book was I went to a lot of data. And I said, I asked, you know, what do Americans think about the free enterprise system? And I, was, I, I faced this question with a little bit of fear and trepidation. If you go back to 1950, uh, the economy, the American GDP was, uh, I should say 25% of American GDP was soaked up by government at all levels. That number today is 45%. So if you take that on its face, it would appear that Americans don't like free enterprise as much as they used to. They like statism more, that maybe European social democracy is the way that reflects public opinion. So I went to the data and I said, what do we want? And the data surprised me a lot. For example, in March of 2009, now this was really the darkest point in our current recession. In March of 2009, the Pew Research Center in Washington, D.C., which is a nonpartisan polling outfit, tilts slightly to the political left, 
asked a large group of Americans anonymously, do you believe that the free market system is the best system for America's economy despite severe ups and downs? That's exactly how they asked the question. Now, worst part of the recession, what are people going to say? Yeah, this free enterprise thing is totally overrated. That's what I was afraid they were going to say. Do you believe that the free market system is the best system for our economy despite severe ups and downs? 70% said yes. They agreed with that statement in March of 2009. That's not what the government was saying. That's not what the mainstream media were saying, but that's what 70% of Americans were saying. 70% said free enterprise is best. 20% said it's not. They disagreed with that statement, and 10% evidently didn't understand the question. So, that's pretty encouraging, 70% in the worst recession. Fast forward a couple of months when the Gallup polling organization asked Americans, do you have a favorable or unfavorable impression of the free, free enterprise system? 86% of Americans said a favorable impression of the free enterprise system. The same poll found that 84% of Americans are favorably disposed toward entrepreneurs. 95% are favorably disposed toward small business. You can't get much better than 95%. Incredible. I, I mean, I suspect that motherhood wouldn't poll quite that well. It is a, a true American principle. It is something that even as our economy was melting down, people were rock solid on these values. Now, at the same time, polls were asking Americans, what do you think about government income redistribution? Because this is the opposite side of the coin. On one side, you have free market principles for making, giving people the rewards of their good judgment and making people face the consequences of their bad judgment. The opposite side of that coin is when the government actually redistributes income. What do people think about that? In the summer of 2009, the Ayers McHenry Polling Organization, which is a big polling firm in Washington, D.C., asked a large group of Americans to evaluate two options and decide which one they liked better. These were two options for what the government should do. Option number one, government policies should promote fairness by narrowing the gap between rich and poor spreading the wealth, and making sure that economic outcomes are more equal. Or option two, government policies should promote opportunity by fostering job growth, encouraging entrepreneurs, and allowing people to keep more of what they earn. Americans chose the second option, 63% to 31%. All of the data show that questions break the same way about the free enterprise system. You can ask about taxes, you can ask about government, you can ask about capitalism, you can even ask about business. You know, business has taken a really terrible rap over the past couple of years, and it's gotten worse and worse. We have an administration, we have a, a leadership, uh, and it's not just one political party, it's politicians in general have been very critical of the whole notion of profit, of business people, being very skeptical about their honesty. I mean, you've heard it, and I'm actually putting this lightly, as you know. So what do Americans think about business? Gallup asked Americans, a large group of Americans, do you believe that, Ameri that, that business is, at the so is the source of America's strength? Do you believe that business is the source of our nation's strength? In the summer of 2009, 76% of Americans said yes. Incredible, more than three quarters of Americans say that the strength of our country comes from business. But here's a small wrinkle in those same data that perplexed me a little bit. The same survey asked the same people if they trusted business. It asked them, do you think too much power is concentrated in the hands of business? Do you trust business, basically? 77% of people said they didn't trust business. So 76% say business is at the strength of our nation, but 77% say yes, but we don't trust business. H how do you square these two things? I, I thought something was wrong with the data. Sometimes surveys aren't conducted right, and when you figure out that they're not, you throw away the data. First thing, even if you like the results, you've got to throw away the data, if you're honest about it. So I was trying to think if something was wrong, and I was discussing this, uh, as I often do, as a research question rolling around in my head. I was discussing it at home at dinner with my family, um, which shows how much fun it is to have dinner at my house. Um, <laughs> and, you know, my, my kids are sort of putting up with this conversation, but my wife is really engaged because she has a lot of street smarts about these types of things. And I said, I, I have this anomaly. I've got this weird thing going on, this book that I'm writing. I've got these data. They're fabulous. They say that three quarters of Americans say that business is, at the, strength of our, is the strength of our nation, but three quarters of the same group say, yeah, but we don't trust business. How is that possible? And she said, oh, that's simple. I said, what? Tell me. Tell me. How does it? And she said, it's just like marriage. And I said, this conversation is going badly already, right? <laughs> she said, 
And she was right. She said, every, it's like this. Everybody loves the institution of marriage, but nobody trusts husbands. <laughs> That's what it's like with business, right? We all love business, but we don't like businessmen. We don't trust businessmen. And actually, you know what? That's pretty smart. That actually is a reflection of the fact that we may love free enterprise, but we're not stupid. And we have standards, and we believe that virtue really matters a lot. And all together, the data basically tell us this. America is a 70-30 nation. 70% of Americans believe in the free enterprise system, and they do so for cultural reasons. 30% of Americans don't believe in the free enterprise system for a variety of reasons. But these percentages have been virtually unchanged for decade after decade. We're a 70-30 nation, despite what you hear in the mainstream media, despite what you hear from Congress, despite what you hear from our leaders on Capitol Hill. So, now, this is interesting for lots of reasons, and it raises some questions that I'm going to get to in here in a second, but I want to note quickly that this is the biggest distinction that we have between Americans and our European friends. If you ask Americans, do you believe that a principal activity of the government should to be to re redistribute income from the rich to the poor, 33% of Americans will say yes. 33% say that the government should be redistributing more income from rich to poor. If you ask Spaniards the same question, 77% say yes. This is a true cultural difference between the United States and Europe. And if you need a vivid uh, demonstration of this difference, think about what's going on in the streets in the United States versus Europe this very day. Today, yesterday, and today, there's been a general strike in Greece. You've been reading about this in the paper. Who is striking? Bureaucrats, union members are throwing Molotov cocktails, burning down their own buildings, demanding early retirement, demanding lavish state pensions, demanding salaries that are being paid by other of their fellow citizens at the time of the worst economic crisis in, their, in the last 50 years of their country's history. What are Americans protesting? The much maligned Tea Party and town hall protesters. What are they protesting? And the answer is, ironically, Tea Party protesters in America are protesting against exactly what the Greeks are demonstrating for. It's pretty interesting. The Greeks are demanding more of a nanny state. The American Tea Party protesters are demanding that the government get out of their business and have fewer subsidies and fewer bailouts and fewer takeovers and less mortgaging the future. Exactly what the Greeks are demanding. This is an example of American exceptionalism. These are real patriots. Now, the irony is that our current leaders are saying that they're not patriots, that they're sellouts, that they're selling out to big business. But there's no evidence of that, and Americans don't believe it. Still, for the time being, for a little while more at least, this is an example of how we're different, and it's something that I believe we should celebrate, that we should be very pleased about. But all of this raises a big question for me, which is this. If we're a 70-30 nation, which we are, manifestly, how come the 30%'s in charge? If we're a democracy, how come the 30% guys are running our country? And there are answers to this question. There are three big answers to this question. Answer number one is that they've been in charge for a long time, and the 70% majority in favor of free enterprise haven't had any options, actually haven't had candidates that represent our true values. Think about it. In the years preceding the Obama administration, we had an administration that was responsible for legislation including 55,000 spending earmarks, those little pieces of undemocratic, unaccountable spending that are snuck into bills and then signed by the President of the United States that build parks and sidewalks and rock and roll cultural fairs and anything that a congressman thinks would be a fun thing to bring home in terms of pork to his district. 55 thousand of those were signed in the Bush administration. The Bush administration was responsible for the largest increase in entitlement spending in American history, Medicare Part D. Was responsible for a 54% increase in the size of the Department of Education. This is not an administration, nor have there been for a long time, an administration that truly espouses and acts on the principles of free enterprise. If you're a 70% majority believer in free enterprise, you haven't seen very many good options. And that's reason number one. November of 2008 was not the beginning of the 30% coalition against free enterprise, simply a continuation of it. It may be from a walk to a run. The second reason, of course, is the financial crisis. The financial crisis over the past couple of years has been a pretext, a perfect excuse, 
for government officials to blame all of the ills of our economy on the free enterprise system. Now, I'm not going to take your time going into the details of the financial crisis. Uh, we enumerate these in vivid detail at the American Enterprise Institute all day long. Suffice it to say, as many of you know, the government, the government was at the root of our current financial crisis, and to blame the free enterprise system is the height of hubris and irony. Yet they do it all the same, because this is a pretext to change American culture. And the third reason that the 30% are in charge today is because of us. It's because we've let it happen, because we haven't chosen. You will hear that the choice between free enterprise and European-style social democracy is a false choice, that it's too Manichaean, that, you know, we don't really have to choose because we're a country of compromises. We compromise between capitalism and socialism. And this, of course, is true. The problem is this. When we base our public policies, when we base our values on compromise, those compromises always break toward redistribution and statism. A little sellout here, a little takeover there, a little bailout here, a little subsidy. It's nice to be good to senior citizens. It's nice to be good to whoever. And every one of those individual policies that sells out and bails out and compromises breaks toward an expanding state. When we don't choose, we never choose our true principles. And the 70% majority, the values that undergird the free enterprise culture, are always compromised. And that's the reason that the 30% are in charge today. It's because of us. So, now, it's, I've made the point that we're a 70-30 nation, and that Americans really do like free enterprise, and it's manifestly true. But I haven't exactly made the argument yet that the 70% is right. That takes a little bit more work. Just because 70% of Americans agree with me doesn't mean that I'm right. I can give you examples historical examples in which a 30% minority viewpoint turned out to be the right viewpoint. We think about it all the time. We think about the civil rights struggle in, in the United States, in which less than 30% of Americans in, in, in the American South believe that African Americans deserved equal civil rights. Yet it turns out, and we all agree today, that that minority viewpoint was the correct viewpoint, morally, economically, and in every other way. The 30%, actually it was less than 30%, was vindicated by the events of history. So why not this one too? Maybe, maybe the 30% minority view about free enterprise is correct today. How do we know that's not right? To, for, to answer that question, we actually have to look at the evidence. We have to go to the good social science. And that points out clearly that the 70% majority has the data on our side. And that's what I'm going to talk about right now. To do this, to talk about this, but we first have to ask, why does the 30% coalition against free enterprise, why do they think free enterprise is such a bad thing for our country? And early on when I was doing research on this, I actually asked a lot of my colleagues in academia, why are you so hostile to the free enterprise system? What's so bad about it? He said, well, it hurts people. I think you've got to be more specific. Why do, you think it's, why do you think it hurts people? What's the real problem? It's kind of a lost art in academia, in social science, to go out and talk to human beings. But I tell you, you can learn a lot from the humans. And, and when you ask people, you know, what, in your heart, why don't you like the free enterprise system? The answer that comes back is this. It makes a less happy country because there's too much income inequality. There's a big source of income inequality in this country, and it's called entrepreneurship. The thing that drives income inequality, the reason we have more income inequality than Europe is because we have more entrepreneurs than in Europe, and people are allowed to keep the rewards of their innovation. When they're entrepreneurs and they're successful, they get rich. And when you get people who get really rich in a free society, you're going to have more income equality. And that, according to the opponents of the free enterprise system, is bad. Because when some people have more than others, there's envy and there's social strife. And it, it tears society apart. And that's bad. That leads to injustice. That leads to unhappiness. And so how do you get a happier society? And the way you get a happier society is by redistribution. Now, before you dismiss that, it's worth pointing out that the data appear to support this point of view. The data show, for example, that people who make more than $75,000 a year are twice as likely to say they're very happy about their lives than people who are making less than $25,000 a year. This is according to data collected by the University of Chicago called the General Social Survey. 
There are a lot of experiments in social psychology that make the same point, or at least they appear to make the same point. My favorite study on the subject comes from the Harvard School of Public Health in 1995. Researchers had a large group of human subjects, and they asked them to choose between two universes. In society number one, they would earn $50,000 a year, and all their neighbors would earn $25,000 a year. Okay? So keep scenario number one in your mind. In scenario number two that they could choose, they would earn $100,000 a year, but all their neighbors would earn $200,000 a year. Now, which world do you think most people chose? And the answer was world number one, where they earned 50, but their neighbors had 25. Why? Because they'd be poorer, only earning $50,000 a year, but they'd be richer than the guy next door. And that's what people apparently wanted. It was kind of a window onto our souls. You know, it's, it's okay to be poorer as long as you're richer than the other guy, right? And that's, that was the main takeaway from the researchers. It, it reminds me, from when I was a kid, I got this advice from my, my father. He said, son, it's not enough to win. Your friends have to lose, too. <laughs> and the data up here to support that idea, that that's how people are wired. We're wired with respect to envy. So if you take that on his face, what do you do? You penalize the forces of income inequality, and you favor the forces that will redistribute, that will smooth things out. And that's exactly what we see the 30% coalition against free enterprise doing today. The first thing that you have to do is you have to reward the forces that smooth everything out. And that, in a nutshell, is government. You reward government. So how have we done that? Well, the federal government in the past 12 months leading up to the end of May has created 86,000 permanent new federal government jobs. This is, these are not the seasonal employment with the census and all that. If you throw all that together, you find that since President Obama has taken office, we have destroyed four million private sector jobs in America, and we have created half a million public sector jobs in America. And that's exactly what you need to do if you want to smooth things out. Now, they're good jobs. Uh, right now, the average public sector worker makes $71,000 a year. The average private sector worker makes $40,000 a year. You can decide for yourself whether or not you think that's just, but it's purposive. We're doing this on purpose. We're rewarding people working for the state. Because when we do that, we can pick the winners that we want. We can lift people up in the way that we want to lift them up. We can give certain people more money, and we can get overall less income inequality. At the same time, you have to penalize the forces of income inequality. That means penalizing entrepreneurship. How do you do that? With a more progressive tax code, which is exactly what we're seeing. Uh, starting in January of 2011, as we all know, families making $250,000 a year or more will see a dramatic increase in their taxes. Others won't. On the contrary, more and more people will be exempted entirely from paying any taxes. Right now, 38% of working Americans have no federal income tax liability. In January of 20, 2011, that will be 47% of working Americans. So more people will pay nothing, and a few people who are making more will be brought down. And that's the idea. If you believe income equality is the right thing to do, you penalize entrepreneurship and you reward government service. That's simply what you have to do. Now that's elegant and it's simple, but it's wrong. And the reason it's wrong is because it leaves out a key piece of evidence in what makes people happy. This assumption that income inequality drives unhappiness in society is patently false when we look at the true evidence in the subject. And, and the evidence we have to look at is on a, a very simple concept called earned success. Earned success is the belief that you are creating value in your life or the life of other people. And people who feel that they have earned a lot of success, no matter how much money they have, no matter how much money they're going to earn, are happier than people who don't feel that they have earned a lot of success. Let me give you an example. The General Social Survey shows the data from the University of Chicago on a vast uh, group of Americans dating back to 1972, shows that if you take two people who are precisely equal, the same race and religion and age and education and region of residence and everything, they're just the same, and both feel that they have earned a lot of success in their profession, but one earns eight times as much money as the second, they will be equally happy in anonymous surveys. In other words, when we control for the earned success that people feel that they have, all the money differences go away. Now, you can find correlations between money and happiness, but the real driver is earned success. In the free enterprise system, when we earn a lot of success, we draw money to us. 
And, but the real reason that we're happier is because of the earned success. Now, I can give you proof that it's not about the money by comparing social entrepreneurs with commercial entrepreneurs. People who earn their success and measure it not in money, but in less earthbound terms. So I've studied, in, in, when, I, when I was at Syracuse, I was teaching social entrepreneurship. So I worked a lot with social entrepreneurs who counted their wealth in terms of souls saved and children who were reading and communities that were stronger and kids who were eating in sub-Saharan Africa and people who were listening to classical music or whatever they thought was going to improve the world around them. Whatever they thought was going to create value in their life or the lives of other people. Commercial entrepreneurs count their success typically in terms of money. It turns out it doesn't matter how you count your success. If you are earning a lot of success, you will be happy. If you are not earning success, you will not be happy. It's an iron law that we find when we look at the data on Americans. Now, you will probably draw money to yourself if you earn your success, but it is the success, not the money, that will make you better off. There are three main conclusions that come from this, three statistical facts that are worth remembering. Fact number one, income inequality does not cause unhappiness. Doesn't matter what politicians say, it doesn't. Fact number two, income redistribution does not increase happiness. It does not increase our level of flourishing. And fact number three is that redistribution lowers the incentives for people to be entrepreneurs and consequently lowers the earned success that people are likely to enjoy. And that is the reason that it lowers happiness. Here's the paradox of income redistribution. It always promises happiness, but it always delivers misery. And the reason is because it attenuates our ability to earn our success. And when it does that, we get less happy. It spreads money around, but there's no government that can spread earned success around. That takes culture. That takes parents. That takes initiative. That takes a system of freedom and opportunity and entrepreneurship. And that, in a nutshell, is free enterprise. That's the reason that free enterprise is not an economic alternative. Free enterprise is a moral imperative. We're, we make a terrible mistake when we talk about free enterprise as if it were about the money. There's money. Money's great. But that's not, the, that's not what we're talking about. That's not what we care about. That's not what young people today want the free enterprise system for. They want to earn their success. We all want to earn our success. And we need to start talking in these terms. And when we do, we will have exercised the moral imperative of the free enterprise system. Now, there's another moral imperative, in my view, which is something that I think that you will not object to if uh, you, like me, are, are Christian people. It's a stewardship imperative. How can we today help more people earn more success? It's not enough, in my view, to say, well, I believe in the free enterprise system, and I do my own job, and I work hard, and to leave it at that. There are too many people who've been left behind in the system of individual opportunity, of opportunity equality, people who don't feel that they have pathways to earn success. And figuring out how people can earn success like we have is truly a moral imperative. It's on a par with the free enterprise system itself, and it's really hard. You know, it's very easy to equalize incomes. How do you do it? Well, you go out and I tax you, and I take the money and I put it into the government and I create government departments and bureaus, and I redistribute the services and the money to poorer people. Simple. I mean, it's kind of a hassle, it's really expensive, but it's easy conceptually, and that's what the government specializes in. It's really hard to equalize a system in which, or to create the system in which people can earn their success. That takes good stewards. That takes good citizens. That takes all of our creativity and time and talent and treasure. But it's the challenge that we all face. The challenge that I face today as the president of AEI is making sure that I'm not leaving the pathway to somebody's earned success out of their lives. What can I do to make it more of a reality? Now, let's say that you agree with me. I want to go back to the three things that I want you to remember from my, my remarks tonight before I close. The first is, Free enterprise is not a right-wing idea. It's not a conservative value. It's certainly not a Republican value. Seventy percent of Americans agree that the free enterprise system is best. We should be fighting across party lines to get more free enterprise and to penalize people in, poli in politics and public life who don't agree with us. This should be beyond partisan bickering. Everybody should remember that 70 percent is a big number and should win every election. 
The second thing I want you to remember is that free enterprise is not about the money primarily. We have lost too many arguments saying that money is what matters. You know, I, I hear all the time debates between free enterprise advocates and people who are against free enterprise, and the free enterprise advocate says, I, I know you guys think that you have greater justice and happiness on your side, but don't you understand? Free enterprise is responsible for two to three extra percentage points on long-term economic growth. That's just boring. That's just, I mean, young people don't respond to that because they shouldn't respond to that. That's, there's no moral content in that. What we're really talking about is what the economic growth will get us, the opportunities that it buys. In fact, the future that we give to our children and grandchildren, the moral content, comes in the flourishing that comes from earned success. We are about happiness, not about money. And the third thing I want you to remember is the comment that I made earlier about fairness. You know, you hear all the time that a fair system is one that creates more equality of income, that spreads the wealth around, in the famous words, from President Obama to Joe the plumber during his 2008 campaign. Ask why we should increase taxes on the wealthy in this country. The president answered, because we need more fairness and balance in our tax code. And when he said fairness, he meant a flatter income redistribution, one in which the poor didn't have so much less than the rich. It was as important to bring the top down as it was to bring the bottom up. Now, that's not how most Americans understand the fairest system. Most Americans think that the fairest system is one that rewards hard work and merit and excellence, and that penalizes corruption and free riding and incompetence and laziness. That's the fairest system. Most of your ancestors, or maybe even you, came to this country not in search of a fair system of government income redistribution. They didn't come to this country in search of a fair system of government welfare, as important as those programs might be. They came to this country for a fair shake where the, where the deck was not stacked against them, where their hard work and their hustle and their street smarts would actually earn them a living. That's the fairest system. And that, in a nutshell, what is working right is the free enterprise system. That's the reason that when we do our jobs right, when we have a system of rule of law and smart government, but most importantly, a system that rewards entrepreneurship and limited government, that the free enterprise system can, can, can take the day and it can give us a true sense of fairness. In its best, it is the fairest system. Now, you know, it's, it's, it's easy to compromise on all these things. There, there are a lot of things that are upsetting, um, if you see the world like I do, coming from government. And not just this government, but from government for a long time. Predations on the free enterprise system. You know, and not just, you know, the health care reforms of today and the financial reforms that are coming down the pike, but all of the things in which government has encroached on your ability and your willingness to be the entrepreneurs that are going to promise our future to the next generation, it's infuriating, it's exhausting, it's easy just to give up. It feels like you're, I feel, sometimes I feel like I'm fighting all the time. It's, uh, you know, my wife says that it's just not that fun to go to parties with me anymore. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, you know, that's actually a compliment because that means that at one point it was fun to go to parties with me. <laughs> uh, why do we fight? Why is it worth fighting? Well, let's remember. Let's remember that when the free enterprise system works, when entrepreneurs are able to enjoy the rewards of their smart judgments and good actions and, and virtue, when entrepreneurs are allowed to earn the fruit, uh, the, keep the fruits of their earned success, we all get amazing things. We get the advances in science and medicine that have saved some of your lives and that will give all of us a better quality of life than we would have had 100 years ago. Entrepreneurs and the fact that they're able to keep their success enjoy their success are the reason that millions of children are educated today and that people have thrown off the chains of collectivist tyrannies around the world because they want to be like us. That has literally changed the world. People, as you know, Americans today are fighting and dying for the privilege of sharing these values of free enterprise because they, because they understand and that we need to remember that the free enterprise system is our gift to America and America's gift to the world. I know that a lot of you believe that or you wouldn't be spending a perfectly good, good evening here listening to my remarks. Uh, the, to the extent that you live this, these values, you share these with others, uh, that you ensure that the free enterprise system will be here. Uh, for my kids and my grandkids, my last word to you is thank you. Thank you, Dr. Brooks. That is um, 
a message that we need. It sort of makes me think of this book as, um, as Hayek's book and other people's books that have been, um, that have had a great impact. You mentioned, and by the way, Charles, now that you've given my bio, I just want to be clear, I was a member of the Bush administration that actually gave back uh, money, that, that argued that we should cut some of our budget. <laughs> and I want the tar and feathers out. <laughs> you, you mentioned culture a few times, and um, it, it's something that's been a part of my studies and my work, um, and, and it, um, it's a concept that can quickly be confused, or people think that you're, you're actually talking about groups of people apart from just how they think. But um, I think it is at root a culture problem in the United States. I recall a, a few years back when Senator uh, uh, Secretary Hillary Clinton was rising in uh, prominence and taking on a, a larger role, and she'd written the book, It Takes a Village. Uh, the Weekly Standard did a piece about the feminization of American politics and policy. And they were making the point that uh, American politics was changing so that uh, politicians wanted to nurture and care for the public uh, as opposed to just uh, be governors, and that this was um, the advocates of, of, uh, of Secretary Clinton were that this was a good thing. Of course, the Weekly Standard had a different view of it. For myself, I think less in terms of gender roles, which can get you in trouble quickly when people want to know what do you mean by that. That's for sure. Uh, and they bring up Margaret Thatcher and say that's <laughs> certainly not feminization of anything. Um, that was a compliment, by the way, to <laughs> Thatcher. Uh, but I think of it more as the infantilization of America, that, that the public has too many people who do want to be looked after. And I think of a generation, the generations 100 years ago or more, they would have been embarrassed. It would have assaulted their dignity to be looked after in any way or to walk away from their mortgage. What would you say about culture change um, is part of this fight to reverse that change, or are we still dealing with a small number that's not growing? Well, the, 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 there's a reason it's called the nanny state. Uh, that's because it's a state that takes care of us. The whole idea of the growing government, the growing social safety net, the, the growing role of government in providing for goods that, that we could or perhaps should uh, be responsible for as citizens um, is, is something that's really alarming to, to you and me and to a lot of Americans, but it so, seems almost like an inevitable trend. Like it's just, it's, it's always going to happen. It's going to creep into our lives and there's no going back. There's actually a lot of evidence that suggests that the nanny state always goes up and never goes down. And the best that we can hope for is that we can cap it. Mm -hmm. If you look at it, you know, Ronald Reagan was, you know, who is the champion of free market advocates. I mean, he's a hero considered to be the greatest president in, I don't know, something like the last million years uh, for Americans. And, and what he did, basically, he, did, he just stopped, he slowed down the growth in government. I mean, he didn't ratchet back the nanny state, no. He slowed it down. He kind of, he, he held it sort of flat. Maybe that's the best thing that we can hope for. But if that's true, the very least that we should do is to talk about stopping the progress of the nanny state. And why? And, and, and the answer is because what it does to us as people. I mean, it's not just that it's expensive, uh, although it is, it's because it hurts the very people it's supposed to help. I mean, think about it, the, the most radical reform, the only example that we can come up with of the nanny state being rolled backwards is welfare reform from 1996. Now, that was conceived of by an AEI scholar, I should say, in 1984, Charles Murray, uh, who wrote a famous book called Losing Ground that said the problem is not that it's expensive. It's really expensive, but look, we're a rich country. No, want to spend more money on social policy? Fine. The problem is that it victimizes and, and throws into dependency generations of people that it's intended to help. And th that, in the language that we're using here tonight, that attenuates people's pathways to earn success. And it's immoral to do that. Nobody should have their pathways to earn success cut off. That's simply abdicating our, our, our stewardship responsibilities as a nation, whether or not you're religious or not. So, that being the case, we have to understand, and it led to a welfare reform that actually rolled that back and saved millions of people's dignity and lives, especially children. The number of children in poverty has plummeted as a result of welfare reform policies. So we should be thinking about social policy all across the board like that. We should have a standard screen that we ask our politicians, what will this policy, if it's enacted, do to, do to dignity? What will it do to independence? What will it do to entrepreneurship? We should have politicians who are specifically designating themselves as watchdogs to roll back affronts to our dignity. And if we don't think about it in terms of morality, and we don't think about it in terms of culture, we only think about it in terms of money, well, that's the end of the free enterprise system. It's only a question of time. Right. 
I was intrigued by the data as well. It was the, one of the most fascinating parts of the book is to, to see all those polls and, and knowing where you're going with them. But each time you would raise a question, I would say, please let the data be on our side. Please let the data be on our side. And it always was. And, um, but, but the voting is not always on the side of the 70%. And, and you mentioned this. And another question I have is the root of this problem, in addition to culture, and maybe this is the same kind of thing, could be one in which um, Americans don't think, and we're at a university and, and you run a think tank, the idea of thinking uh, and not letting your emotions, not letting your passions make the decisions. I think the 30% wins often because, as you say, they make the, an argument based on emotion. And even there, though, they're wrong uh, if you bring in those um, touchy-feely things about human flourishing. But think of uh, when uh, President Clinton put forth his health care reform, I recall, and this was in the early 90s, I recall that initially it was very popular. Lots of polls showed people saying, this is great, let me have that. And then Senator Graham of Texas almost single-handedly uh, released all the facts, started talking about uh, this, this is what this means, here are the facts. And then the polls began to shift mm -hmm. and it became so unpopular, they dropped it. Um, I look at that and say it shouldn't have taken that. Why don't people understand simply that you can't have something for nothing. Well, I would like that too. I mean, I would like everybody to, you know, spend the first 15 minutes of their day going to AEI.org and reading the new articles that we have up there because, you know, the think tank would vastly enrich our country. If everybody read that, you know, they'd say, hey, you know, we've got free market solutions to the biggest problems and there's no such thing as a free lunch. But, you know, it turns out most people have jobs and lives and they're not... More, they're not university professors and, and, and think tank researchers. They, they're trying to, to get along, basically. And they, when somebody offers you something for free, it takes a little while before you, before you say, well, yeah, I don't actually believe that that's free. And furthermore, I think that, that's in, that's, that goes against my principles. It takes a little while for people to do that. In, in Europe, they don't do it at all. You offer them something for free, and they gobble it right up. I mean, that's, that's the difference, is the fact that we do get to that point, that we can make a compelling argument. So, I spend a lot less time regretting the fact that Americans don't always intuitively come to the free enterprise argument when something is offered for free, and I have a lot more consolation in the fact that we can actually get there. But what does it take? It takes two things. It takes great ideas. It takes this institution providing the great ideas that will provide real solutions for policy problems that are based in liberty, and it takes real leadership. It takes people who are able to make the case, who are actually to go, go out there and reward the revolutionary ideas, revolutionary in the best sense, as in the American Revolution. When we lose the ability to make the ideas, or we have the unwillingness or inability to do that, because all of our college campuses and mainstream media and the entertainment industry have been completely colonized by people who are in the 30% coalition against free enterprise, and institutions like this stop leading the way in ideas, and when we're unwilling to reward the revolutionary ideas in the best sense, then we're lost. As long as we have those two things, I'm, I'm pretty confident that Americans can make the right choice, ultimately. I want to ask you, who, who are the 30 percent? Who are the 70 percent? Uh, particularly when we talk about the leaders or the most prominent among them. And, and um, I'm on occasion, it might surprise you, that I'm accused of being harsh. But I want to suggest that the 30 percent perhaps are corrupt, and the 70% are cowards. Why can't we draw such conclusions? <laughs> uh, yeah. Um. <laughs> you don't have to agree. <laughs> the 70% the are us. The 30% are made up of three groups, not all of whom are, are corrupt. Uh, the 30% coalition are made up of three basic groups. Now, at the top, five percentage points approximately, of the 30% are idea leaders, people in the upper income, upper education, idea professions in law, journalism, entertainment, politics, and academia. That's basically who we're talking about. Now, they're irredeemable. Basically, they're, they're largely, they're, they're well past the age of, of being decorrupted. And uh, you know, believe me, I come from academia, and I can tell you um, that if you took all of those people and you put them in a, in a boat, that would be good. <laughs> so, and uh, okay, so then, but that's five percentage points of the 30. Then let's take, there's another 10 percentage points of the 30 that feel they've gotten a raw deal by the American free enterprise system. They feel they've been victimized by the American free enterprise system. And frankly, free enterprise advocates have not done enough. That's the stewardship challenge. 
for the free enterprise movement is reaching out to people who felt historically that they've gotten a bad deal and said our 30-year plan is to win them back and to win them back not just by browbeating them and not just about marginalizing them politically but actually figuring out real pathways to earn success. What are the entrepreneurship and leadership education opportunities? What are we doing in economically vulnerable neighborhoods that show people pathways to earn success? What is our time, talent, and treasure doing on the ground to meet those 10% of the population, that one-third of the 30% coalition that feel that way? That's a, and, and the sooner we start, the sooner we get there. But right now, I gotta tell you, the Republican Party and American conservatives are not doing enough. They're simply saying, okay, we don't need those guys. We do need those guys morally, we need those guys. And then you've got the 15 percentage points, the half of the 30% coalition that's left. And that's largely young people that don't have, have not reflected very much on their politics, have not reflected very much in economics, who haven't earned a living very long, who haven't started a family yet, and who simply haven't been one yet. That, that's the opportunity of our age, is actually getting to people and saying, look, you know, this is not your grandfather browbeating you over the fact that capitalism is best because it's no fun to pay taxes and the government's no good. That's not what we're talking about. This is your opportunity, man. This is your entrepreneurship. This is whether or not you're going to be able to earn your success. This is your flourishing. It's your world. I mean, the reason that we should be talking to the 15 percentage points, the half of the 30% coalition, who are 18 to, to 29, basically, is because after I'm dead, it's their world. And they deserve the great world that I have right now. Basic, rock solid, convincing with facts, based on flourishing, not on money. That's the 30% coalition. I'm very sympathetic to 25 out of the 30 percentage points of them. In, in the uh, 80s, President Reagan was the kind of figure that um, I think was largely responsible for so many young people being a part of the 70 coalition, understanding it, talking about it. Um, who are the, the natural leaders of the 70% coalition that can do those kinds of, uh, that, that can provide that kind of leadership? That's a big problem today. Um, you, you just don't order up a Reagan, right? <laughs> Give me a Reagan, you know, with a side of Bush. You know, it's not, that's not how leadership gets done. It's more organic in the war of ideas. Um, the war of ideas requires that people hash out values and cultural concepts and facts and public opinion and leaders emerge or they don't. And you know, the great uh, danger that we have is that we get more people who s espouse the, the ideas of free enterprise but don't live those ideas and set back this movement for earned success by another 15 years. It's entirely possible. And that really requires that we hold people's feet to the fire, that we, add, that we have a, a test, not an ideological test, but a, a moral test of why people really want the capitalist system. Why do you want it? And it's not good enough to say just because it's good for business. It's not good enough to say that. We want the language of, of ultimate opportunity. And once we actually start holding leaders to account for these moral principles, we're going to get people who think about this in the right way. And furthermore, we're going to get the right kinds of people who want to be the leaders. There's a, it's a very disheartening fact when you go to Washington, D.C., that there aren't enough people like you who are representing your communities. There's a, there's a reason that none of us, very few of us want to be a congressman. <laughs> and it's not just because it's kind of a, not a very fun job and you end up sleeping in your office a lot. It's because it doesn't feel, there's not, there's not the, the gestalt of citizen leadership that we really want. That we, read, the, the, read the diaries of Thomas Jefferson. You know, he, he didn't want to be a politician, but he felt that he had to serve, that it was a citizen's job to serve his country. We have a professionalized, opportunistic political class at this point. That's a problem right now. And inculcating leadership, morals-based servant leadership, is the way this have to, has to start. That's a 50-year plan, incidentally. And that, that starts a lot with higher ed. I would like to turn to uh, what the role of the church is, uh, what the role of Christians is in this. And um, you are a serious Christian believer. Uh, most of this audience, I'm sure, looks at this as these are not two separate realms. These are all a part of the same thing. If, if there is truth, it's God's truth, and it applies to every aspect of life. What is the role of uh, Christians and Christianity? What is the role of the church? Um, has it been playing that role well in this? Is it to blame in part, or to what degree, for the state we have, particularly that the youth are um, a part of the 30% coalition and think that they are morally superior for it? The, the role that the 
church plays in, in the free enterprise movement is a highly ambiguous one. I don't think that very many serious commentators can make a compelling case that, that uh, Jesus had a particular political point of view or would have had a particular point of view in the, in the current fight. I think it's, I think it's totally... He wasn't a Republican? <laughs> I think it was to totally hubristic, and I think it's dangerous, actually, to go down that line. I mean, and, and part of the reason is because the moral principles that undergird Christianity transcend uh, these economic realities that we face. Economics is really important, and economics is a wonderful tool, but economics is not... Economics doesn't fall... It's, it's a, it, it is simply a tool. It is like any other tool that we can use for good or we can use for evil. We can use it for fundamental Christian principles or we can use it against fundamental Christian principles. But to say that, that the, our economy, our capitalism, is inherently Christian is a big mistake. I can give you lots of examples of people working within the capitalist system who are working contrary to properly ordered principles of Christianity. We need to use to every tool at our disposal to espouse our core values and our core beliefs, which transcend those tools themselves. Now, that said, I think that there's been a lot, that, that, that what I've just said, has been, has been completely misconstrued by a lot of people in, in, the, in mainline Protestantism, to a lesser extent in evangelical Protestantism, absolutely in my own Roman Catholic Church, where they believe that there's an inherently moral stance and that the government has a role, the government has a critical central role in making sure that Christian stewardship is manifest. That, and the way that you do that is through income redistribution, is the whole idea. It's, it's not just naive, it's actually dangerous. And, and the reason it is, it is dangerous is because, once again, it withdraws agency and creates dependency. And that's, in my view, terrible stewardship. It's a terrible thing to do. To, it, it deprives people of their inherent humanity. Think about this. What, what does it take to get meaningful social change, to get meaningful social improvement? Very few of you would say, the way that you do that is by coercing a large enough group of people to do what I want them to do. Yet that's the government project when it comes to social engineering. Most of you would say, we need to change people's hearts. That's how you get meaningful social change. You convert people to thinking in a particular way. You get them to reflect on goodness. That's a much harder project. There's, there's an old joke. A socialist is a man who loves humanity, but in, only in groups of one million and above, right? So, okay, that's, in other words, you can sacrifice individuals till the cows come. I'm going to take your, I'm going to take away your rights. I'm going to, I'm going to tax you. I'm going to take away your hard-earned money. I'm going to not let you give a, a pass on money to your children. I'm going to do all of these things that strip you of your control, that, that take away your dignity. Why? Because I want the money and I can spread it around better. That's hugely problematic. I, and I, I uh, welcome you to uh, joining me in regret of those policies. Yeah. What, what are practical things that um, leaders of the Christian church could do to affect some of that change? Uh, I'm not necessarily thinking of sermons, but maybe I am. What, what kinds of things uh, can be done? We, we talked about Father Sirico earlier, the Acton Institute, which is a, a wonderful organization, but it's only one organization. Um, there are Protestant pastors that speak on these things sometimes. Usually they wait till the 4th of July and slip in something. But the, even they're sort of embarrassed about it. What can people who, who purport to be leaders of, of Christians do other than pick topics like global warming or something like that that they feel like they're safe on and talk about this? Um, my belief is that the way that we, that we can make real improvements, people not just leaders of the church, but people who are in, in all positions of authority and leadership, uh, particularly moral authority and leadership, college professors, entertainers, journalists, people in, 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 that have these big mouthpieces, what can they do? And the answer is finding everybody's pathways to earn success, looking at each individual and say, how can I help people to be more successful and to earn their own success? It's not a question of, of standing up in the pulpit and saying everybody needs to vote for a particular party. That's an exercise in futility. It also contravenes American tax code. You're not supposed to do that. You're not supposed to advocate for politicians. And you know, an organization like mine, you're not even supposed to say, here's, here's how politicians should vote on a particular policy. That's not right. That's actually illegal. But, but what we can do is to think about what it's going to take for people to enjoy the fruits of the system of individual opportunity. What are we going to do to get more in opportunity equality? And, and there are all kinds of examples of, of organizations that do that. You know, the, um, our friends, the 
the Mormons have a wonderful track record of lifting up members of their own community. You, you rarely hear about Mormons that are on welfare, on government welfare. Why? Because the Mormon Church, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, runs the single largest uh, private welfare system in the world. And how does it run? On the basis of mutual aid and accountability. If you're a Mormon family, you work in canneries and you sort clothes and you, you're responsible for both the, for the supply side of the welfare system. Your hands are in it. It's not just a question of taxing people and spreading the money around and some faceless bureaucrat making the decisions. You're passing out the food. And if you're on the, collective, on the collecting side, you have a, there's a sense of responsibility to your neighbors. What does that do? That accountability actually helps people remember the pathways to their earned success, to not stay on the system of, of dependency. So the question is, how can we learn from that? How can we learn morally from, in our positions of leadership, to find ways to help people not slip into these victim and victimized roles? Well, speaking of the youth as we have been, and, and to, to go more directly to that, if, if you were in charge of the core curriculum of a great Christian university, like say in Houston, <laughs> what, what would you say the students all should study, and particularly the kinds of courses, the content. How would you make sure that from the core curriculum forward through their education, you, you can make a difference in the way they think about these things? The, what we can't take for granted is that uh, both positive and negative examples of liberty will automatically be taken on board by young people. I have a colleague named Michael Novak, and some of you have read a great deal of his work. He's, uh, wonderful philosopher and theologian. And he, he has written really eloquently, historically, about liberty. And he said liberty is, is uh, such a wonderful and fragile thing. It can be lost in one generation. And how do you lose it? And the answer is you don't pass on the positive and negative lessons about, about liberty. You know, it's, it's a funny thing, people my age, I'm in my mid-40s, and people my age remember Soviet communism. They remember what it did to people. We, we saw, people my age saw that when we were younger. We saw you know, hundreds of millions of people subjugated, and we th saw people throwing off their chains so they could be like you and me. Extraordinary. That's how the Iron Curtain came down. But when I, went, when I was teaching at the university, when I was teaching at Syracuse, my students had no recollection of that. They don't remember that. They say, you know, when I would ask, you know, what's a socialist? They would say, you know, a college professor. You know, they, it, would, it would, that's what a socialist looked. It didn't look like Stalin. It looked like me, basically. So what's our responsibility? It's making sure that that negative lesson isn't lost. And that means we teach liberty. How do you teach liberty? You don't have to say, more freedom. We need more freedom. You don't have to browbeat people. You have to talk about what the fruits of freedom really have been and how, what has happened when they've been taken away. You know, there is a core competency in freedom education, and we can inject it into the core curriculum across virtually every set of classes. How do we teach business? We teach it on the basis of the fact that there are three pillars in any economic, econ uh, in, in any policy. Efficiency, fairness, and freedom, and making sure it doesn't get short shrift. We make sure that we focus on that in history, we make sure that we focus on this in social science and the humanities, and that if that's the core, sort of the mother load concept, we're off to a very good start. I uh, have questions from the audience I would like to, to ask, but, but uh, one last one for me before we do that, and, and that is a lot of times uh, people who think about these things, uh, uh, who think philosophically, and, and particularly Christians think of these things, but um, of, the, of the human rights that we respect, uh, that we think are a part of the laws of, of nature, nature's God, which do you think, which do you argue is the single most important right that, that has to be protected for freedom to matter and to exist and to last? Well, you know, our, our founders said there were three unalienable rights, among them life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Of course, they're really tied together. Without life, you can't have liberty. Without liberty, you can't have the pursuit of happiness. And that doesn't mean the guarantee of happiness, right? The government doesn't guarantee happiness. The government can guarantee the right to the pursuit of happiness, which is the sine qua non of the expression, the workaday expression of our liberty, and which has to be guaranteed by life. We start with life. We continue through liberty, which we talked about in the educational system, and we proceed through to the less earthbound concept, the, the heaven on earth. If we use that as a model, uh, which is one in which we can pursue our happiness and in occasional glimpses in our lives, achieve it. 
I, I like that answer very much. I, I often get into a debate uh, with Christians, particularly about freedom of religion or freedom of commerce, which is more important. My view is it's obviously commerce. Freedom of religion is meaningless if you don't have the ability to take care of yourself, not be the ward of some nanny who then tells you how you have to behave and act. And uh, it's an interesting argument to get people to think about um, how important all these issues are. Sure, it's a, it's, I mean, the idea of having to choose between freedom of religion and freedom of commerce, I mean, that's, that's, that's tough stuff. In, in point of fact, there are no examples of freedom of religion and freedom of commerce existing in isolation. And, and, and it's, worth, it's really worth pointing out that, you know, that one of the great, one, one of the, the reasons that the United States is the most religious country and the freest country in the world is the fact that we, we practice effectively freedom of commerce in the realm of religion. I mean, I hate to make it so grubby and earthbound, but, but when you think about it, there's nothing that's been better for the religious ecosystem in America than the fact that we have a free market for souls. I mean, I, it sounds awful. You, you can I, preach, I, I withdraw that. But you, you can know, preach Tocqueville here anytime. I mean, it's, it's an extraordinary thing. I, I lived in, my wife's from Spain, which has a monopoly religion. I mean, it happens to be a great religion in my view, to what one, I'm a card-carrying member of it, but it's a monopoly religion. Why is Roman Catholicism so much more successful in the United States than it is in Spain? The answer is because it's got competition, because people are actually working to convince people that this is the right flavor, this is the right brand, this is the right, you know, the comfortable place for them to worship. Freedom of commerce and freedom of religion are all basically simply part of freedom. They're basically part of treating us as individuals capable of expressing our will and making our own decisions, that coming up with our own, our own values and expressing those values. Freedom is freedom. Right. And freedom in, in particular to be independent, to not be a ward of anyone. Indeed. Uh, question from the audience, you say, being an entrepreneur is part of our humanity. Can you elaborate on this idea? This is, uh, being an entrepreneur certainly is part of uh, American society, and I would go so far as to say that the evidence suggests that it's part of our DNA. I don't say that lightly, I mean that literally. There is a, a growing body of social science evidence that suggests that Americans are genetically different in their proclivity to, to, uh, to take risk, to put capital at risk compared to our European cousins. You know, what's the difference between Norwegians and Americans? The answer is all the entrepreneurs in Norway came to Minnesota. And I mean, it, it is the, 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 the most entrepreneurial act is the act of immigration, which puts all of our capital at risk, linguistic, spiritual, commercial, social. You leave one country with nothing and you don't speak the language and you go to another country where you have to learn the language and make friends because you want a fair break. You're gonna put all your capital at risk for a better life. That's how entrepreneurs do it. Now, if you take a mutated characteristic, like putting all your capital at risk. I mean, ordinary, sensible people don't generally do that, but everybody does that in another country, virtually everybody does that in another country, you're gonna get a loading on a particular characteristic. And if you're the children and grandchildren, and, and as the data suggests, a lot of our personality has a genetic basis to it. I mean, there's a, a lot of evidence on that at this point, which I won't bore you with now. It's quite fascinating. I assure you, it is, it, it, what, what you're gonna get is a genetically different country, and that's how it would be encoded into our, into our effectively, our humanity. That's what you mean by it's in the DNA. That's what I mean, exactly. Yeah. I, mean it, I mean it quite literally. Right. I read the book, I really did. Well done. <laughs> this, these, are, uh, these are a little more challenging, I think, uh, the, the, the next two. If Warren Buffett invests a billion dollars in a new electric car industry that employs 10,000 people, is he creating a big increase in earned success? Well, it depends, certainly. Um, I can invest in something and at the same time rent seek with my government to make it successful. I mean, one, one of the reasons that we have trouble in our entrepreneurial system is because big business, crony capitalism, has such a, a, a Faustian tendency to crawl into bed with the, the big government. And so you, if, I, if I saw some uh, fairly leftist billionaire uh, investing in an electric car company, the first thing I'd want to know, when I put on my Sherlock Holmes hat, I'd say, who's he dealing with in government that's making it harder for him to have competition, generally speaking. Now, if, there, if competition reigns supreme, and this is a better technology, and furthermore, it's using fewer fossil fuels and has a lower carbon footprint and is respectful of our environment and it leaves a better world for our kids, that's great, I love it, I'm completely on board, I'll invest. 
I'll invest morally. I don't want a bailout of it. I don't want subsidies for it. But if this is leading to a better world, that's, that's, there's a ton of earned success there, and I think it's great. What would proper stewardship look like under your free enterprise system? How would it address disasters created by poor planning and lack of foresight and safety, such as the SEC, scrutiny there, or predatory lending? Uh, your model assumes that good stewards of free enterprise are omniscient. Um, I wish they were. Um, I honestly wish that we didn't need a state. But in point of fact, uh, the free enterprise system requires a good government. The free enterprise system requires rule of law. Anybody who believes that we should have no regulation does not understand the free enterprise system, doesn't understand that people are imperfect, that information is imperfect, and that markets frequently fail. If you go back to Adam Smith in 1776, the ultimate, I mean, the, 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 who's the, whose ideas were the lodestar for the free enterprise movement today, Adam Smith said that the government needs to be, be uh, involved in the free enterprise system when markets tend to fail. And he said markets tend to fail under four circumstances. When you have monopoly, when you have what economists call externalities, things like pollution, when you have public goods, things that people want but they don't have an incentive to pay for, like a standing army, and when you have really big problems with information. So one side knows a lot and the other side doesn't know very much, and you can have people taking advantage of each other. Adam Smith said that's when you need government potentially to be involved. Friedrich von Hayek, who wrote The Road to Serfdom, I mean, there's no more influential book in the free enterprise movement said that there are two things that the government should legitimately do. Number one is, is circumvent cases of market failure so that the free enterprise system can work. And number two is to think about what a minimum basic standard of living should be. He sounds like a bleeding heart, right? Well, that's just common sense. Anybody who thinks that we should have no government and no rule of law and no regulation doesn't understand the free enterprise system. The problem is this. What the government specializes now is not helping markets to succeed. It's in making markets fail. How do you make markets fail? With two principles. Number one, people should have no risk in their lives. And number two, we shouldn't have any income inequality. And when you do that, you specialize in three kinds of policies, bailouts, social engineering, and pork barrel spending. And that's what's spending an extra $10 trillion right now of your children and grandchildren's money. That's what the government's doing. And that's the problem. Is the, uh, related to this, I think, is, is the question, is the, um, the job of a corporation to make profits for shareholders, or is it to do some sort of good in the world? Um, the job of a corporation is to create value for shareholders and thus create good in the world. So yes. I, the answer is yes, <laughs> but of course there's a lot of responsibility that goes into that. Once again, when you create shareholder wealth, markets can fail. And when markets are failing, that's a problem. And we have a moral responsibility when markets are failing to see that we not create damage to the economy, to the environment, and to future generations. And furthermore, when, when those failures are too hard to circumvent, that's why we've got a state. So, you know, we, we want corporations, and, and not just corporate, we don't want just big business. We're talking about profit-making endeavors to make profit. We know that in point of fact that when profit is made, that entrepreneurs are enjoying the rewards of their earned success, and we all benefit. If it weren't for that, we wouldn't have dialysis machines, and we wouldn't have space shuttles, and we wouldn't have all this stuff that actually comes from people enjoying the rewards of their earned success. At the same time, people or enjoying the, the rewards of their earned success can actually lead to problems in markets, and that requires our morality and our smart government to be paying attention. Um, with government responsible for the financial crisis, how can the future of free enterprise not fall victim to this again in the future? And I assume this is directed at Wall Street banks. Uh, yeah. But I would hope at people who bought houses they couldn't afford. Yes, indeed. Um, there's so much blame to go around in the current financial crisis. I mean, anybody who says, there, there were three, three blameworthy parties in the current financial crisis, the government, business, and us, and citizens, basically. So Main Street, Wall Street, and Pennsylvania Avenue, or something like that, right? I mean, basically, there was tons of blame to go around, and, and in a nutshell, it worked like this. The government, uh, the federal government had a housing policy, a, a social engineering housing policy that said that everybody should own a house. And it had an explicit policy of, of forcing two government-sponsored enterprises called Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac to make more middle and low income loans to people. Doing so, it created incentives for private sector banks to get involved in the same enterprise. 
But in so doing, that's what inflated the housing bubble, and bubbles always break, and created the financial crisis, starting with the housing bubble bursting that sparked the fire that burned down our financial system. There was a lot of stupid malfeasance on the part of Wall Street institutions and in complex derivative instruments that are not even worth going into, the things that we all have heard too much about, mortgage-backed securities and, and such that nobody knew anything about until this happened, but let's remember that this started with bad government housing policy. Now, politicians are prevaricating to avoid blame. Politicians are telling us that it was not Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac with the, the full faith and credit of the federal government up to that were carrying $4 billion in risky mortgages owned by the government that were purchased by the government, and that's what the problem was. And the reason they're doing that is for two reasons. Number one is they want to maintain control. And number two, the very politicians in charge were getting paid off by these government-sponsored enterprises. The two top politicians getting, getting campaign funding from the organizations that burned down our economy were Chris Dodd in the Senate and Barack Obama, the current president of the United States. Campaign cash was flowing around. I mean, it's just, it's shocking how squalid the entire system was. And at the same time, of course, you had citizens that were taking out the mortgages that they couldn't afford. Of the early defaulting mortgages in America, 70% had fraud on their applications. A very, uh, a, a, a conservative estimate says from economists at the University of Chicago today shows that 25% of mortgage defaults were called strategic, which is to say that the, that the mortgage holders didn't have to walk out on their mortgages. They elected to do so because it was a good investment decision. That is simply immoral. That's us. It's our government, which is a reflection of our views, and it's us making bad decisions. And ultimately, it comes down to shared responsibility. So how are we going to avoid this in the future? Is by being smarter and hold our, holding ourselves to more account. And not, furthermore, not blaming one single party, but understanding that there was greed, malfeasance, stupidity, uh, uh, plenty for everybody all around. And renting an apartment instead of trying to have a house you can't afford. Um, I, at the risk of sounding partisan, it is my understanding that during the Bush administration, uh, there were members of Congress who attempted to rein in Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, and the Bush administration supported those attempts, but it was killed in the Senate um, by probably a bipartisan uh, posse of murderers. But isn't that accurate? That it, there was an attempt by the Bush administration to say, this is a real problem. Mm -hmm. We need to do something about Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. Sure. There, there were periodic attempts to, to rein in this problem. I mean, Alan Greenspan... Um, who you know, a lot of people criticize because of he pursued a super low interest rate policy that encouraged everybody and his dog to go out and buy more house than they could afford. So there's a lot of criticism floating around about the Federal he Reserve opened System. The dam but, and then said, watch out. Yeah, but then he said, basically, this is a very dangerous thing, that Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac are, are on the wrong road, and they could spark a fire in the financial system. And, and sure enough, uh, a, a group of Republican senators, led by John McCain, um, proposed legislation that was ultimately killed to rein in Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, that if it had done that, we would not have had the financial crisis. We were quite sure we would not have had the financial crisis. But they, they gave up anyway. They lost the vote and they gave up. Um, people stopped talking about it, and half of the, highest, of the 20 highest recipients of campaign cash from Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac were Republicans. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's one thing to say, I had this idea, and eh, they shot it down and I didn't pursue it, so it's really their fault. But, you know, that's not how it works. You know, when something's not right and something's going to wreck your economy, you stay with it if you're really a good steward, if you're really a good leader, in my point of view. So how is the, you know, what's the culpability? 55, 45 percent? I don't know. Well, I, I would make it even, or I wouldn't try yeah. to distribute it. But, but this gets back to this notion of cowards. Uh, I think that they let it go because they were afraid of looking like they were saying, I don't want minorities to have homes, or I don't want poor people to have homes, et cetera, rather than bucking up and, and having the moral courage to make an argument that 70% of this country apparently would go, well, yeah, that's right. Yeah. If, you, if you make the argument forcefully and, and, and with courage and you're actually willing to lose votes over it, then you can actually do some good. But we haven't had a culture of people taking, putting political capital at risk. Is there a historical example of sustained capitalism and how can we utilize this model? The best uh, model of sustained capitalism, of course, is the United States an utterly imperfect one, and one that's been under tremendous strain. But let's remember, um, it appears the center does appear to be holding. I mean, we were really worried about the capitalist system, but it appears to have persevered. Uh, we still are a beacon of hope to the world. Now, there are other 
countries around the world that are experimenting more aggressively with courageous capitalist systems. But I have to say, it's still, I mean, as imperfect as, as we are, by international standards, we're still the last best hope. Are places like Australia, New Zealand, long term, going to be more like the United States, less like Greece and Spain? And yeah, I mean, there are, and then once again, it's a cultural issue. Uh, the, the Australia and New Zealand have uh, more of a sort of an Anglospheric understanding of personal responsibility, and the, that's a culture that, and they're also immigrant cultures that, uh, that lend themselves better to, to the capitalist system. Right. Right. This has been wonderful. Thank you for your insights tonight. Thank you. Thank you.